Okay, so we have the meeting being recorded. Like I said, these are the things that we're gonna cover. The diaphragm style carburetors that you would find on a small two-stroke engine, that would be like a um, string trimmer or what folks would commonly call the weed eater or a chainsaw or maybe like a, a power pruner, any of these handheld things, a leaf blower, those use a diaphragm style carburetor. Um, if you go through the still training, it'll, it'll go through those carburetors, but I'll cover those carburetors next week as well because they are a little different. My focus today though is to make sure that you guys are equipped with the tools that you need to, to pass the Briggs and Stratton uh, fuel system test. And so we're gonna focus on that and then we'll switch over to governors because traditionally I've had lots of students struggle with the governor's test. And it is a little tricky, to be honest with you. I even struggled with governors at first because my history with governors was always taking them off the engine. I thought, I don't want that governor on there, get rid of it. Um, so those will be our two topic areas today. So with that, I'm gonna change my um, screen share and I'm going to move this over to the internet. And we're just gonna look at a little bit of our um, small engines class on Canvas. Now remember my Canvas login will look a little bit different than yours because it's the teacher version. But what I wanted to get to was just to make sure that everybody knows where the information's at. Every once in a while I do this and I realize, oh, it's not where I thought it was. Um, okay, so we are moving through module three, kind of finishing up module three, if you will, and then working in module four. Um, at the beginning of each module, whether it's um, module three here or module four, I've tried to um, link in the presentation from the, the normal small engine textbook. So that is what's trying to load up on my screen. And just to make sure everything's working correctly, um, can you guys see that chapter five fuel systems? Okay, yeah, good. I got a thumbs up. <laughs> that was, that's cool. Like now I got to think, well, how, how do you do this? How did, how did you do the thumbs up? All right. Um, okay. So if I click on download here, of course, I could download that presentation. What I've done today is I've, I've already done that. I've downloaded them so you don't have to wait for it to, to load. But I did want to point out that the chapters or the presentations that match the chapters in the textbook are on Canvas. And some of your test questions on the Briggs and Stratton website are like you have, the, the information is in the book. Um, so I've had a lot of questions over this last week. Well, I've watched all the Briggs and Stratton videos. I can't find the, I can't find all the answers in the videos. Well, the reason is, is because not all the answers are in the videos. The, Briggs and Stratton, um, actually, the, the, their chief technical engineer guy is the guy that wrote our textbook. And so they're assuming that you have the textbook that also matches up with things. Um, so just to let you know, you won't, you won't necessarily find all the questions in the, in the videos. Um, if you poke around on the internet, you, you, you can figure stuff out. And that's, that's what we'll, we'll do a little bit today. Um, okay, so I wanted to point that out. And what I also did is I went ahead and downloaded the images uh, from the Briggs and Stratton fuel systems test, tried to blow those up and make those a little bit easier to view. And so I put those on Canvas as well, thinking that that, that might be as some assistance. And we'll use these pictures to talk about, the, about different things, okay? So with that, I'm now gonna switch my screen share again. And this time I'm going to switch over to uh, chapter five fuel systems. And with this chapter five, um, I may not hit every single um, slide because last week we did a pretty darn good job talking about 
uh, carburetors and how they work, but we kind of ignored the rest of the fuel system. So we're gonna focus on those rest of the fuel system slides today and the slides that will in particular help you answer test questions, right? That's important. Okay, um, just throwing this out there, gasoline is commonly called hydrocarbons. Um, actually, if you get your car smogged, one of the things we would test on a smog test where we actually put the probe in the tailpipe was for hydrocarbons or basically raw fuel come out of your tailpipe. And this shows you a picture of the um, molecular structure of hydrocarbons. Um, with this slide, what I will say is if an, an internal combustion gasoline engine, if it was running perfectly, it would make carbon dioxide and water. But realistically, they don't run perfectly. So we get some carbon monoxide and we get some hydrocarbons that don't get burnt, we get some oxides and nitrogen. So we get all this kind of nasty, nasty stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and write something on the screen here. I'm gonna write CO. That's carbon monoxide. That's that coderless, coder, colorless, odorless uh, gas that comes out of your uh, internal combustion engine that will uh, put you to sleep and basically kill you pretty nasty stuff. And what happens is if the hydrocarbons, the HCs don't get completely burnt into CO2, if the carbon only combines to one oxygen instead of two, two oxygens, it's CO. Instead of CO2, that's carbon monoxide. That's something you don't really want to breathe. And that's something we test for on a smog test. And that, I believe, lines up with one of your test questions. So um, even though we don't get our small engines smog tested, they are emissions tested at the factory, if you will, and have to meet emissions regulations. So don't, don't forget about that. Okay, uh, this slide has a whole bunch of different um, air fuel ratios on it. And we talked about this a little bit last week as well. Um, for gasoline, our ideal air fuel ratio is 14.7 to 1. So um, that's right about 15 or so. And if we had a modern fuel injected engine, it would be running right, right at this ratio. However, because most of our small engines, they're air cooled and we use the the fuel that add to some cooling because they're air cooled and they're carbureted, they usually run a little bit on the richer side, somewhere around 13 and a half to maybe 14. To, that's just basically 13.5. Uh, 13 and a half to 14 to one is what they would normally run at. Okay, so this is um, our ideal air fuel ratio. There is a fancy name for that, and that fancy name is stoichiometric right down here at the bottom. Um, so this is your ideal air fuel ratio where the engine runs clean and it makes pretty darn good pow power. So it's kind of the best of best compromise of everything. Honestly, if I wanted a little bit more power, I would run the engine richer. If I wanted a little bit better fuel economy, I'd run the le engine leaner, give it less fuel. But our ideal compromise where our emissions are good, our fuel economy is pretty darn good, and our power is pretty darn good, is the stoichiometric ratio, which again is 14.7 to 1. All right, um, and that should line up with another test question. Now, a side note, you see this little symbol here that stands for lambda a lambda value of one is the same thing as saying stoichiometric or for gasoline, again, that would be 14.7 to one. So don't let those, it's, you know, in, if for whatever reason in technical areas, whether it's automotive or small engines, um, and pretty much any technical, we love to have our own fancy acronyms and, and 10 different names for the same exact thing. And that's how this is here. How are you sitting right now? Any questions on that? Okay. All good so far. Okay, I'll keep going forward. Um, I skipped over a few things uh, related to uh, gasoline and we should talk about that. Um, 
what I'm going to put on the screen here is that we have um, we have summer gas. So a summer gasoline blend, and then we also have winter gas. Okay. Now this chart shows you that there's all these additives they put in gasoline. It's not just hydrocarbons. There's anti-icers and antioxidants and corrosion inhibitors and detergents and rust preventatives and stuff like that in our gasoline. Um, but there's also two different, two different blends. So the winter gas is going to be made more volatile. What does that mean? That means if I spilled it, it's going to evaporate easier. And to help our engines start up easier in cold weather, we, that we purposely blend the gasoline to be more volatile, to, to evaporate easier. So I'm going to put a more volatile blend. In the summer, what happened? Well, I kind of moved it in my own scribble, but uh, in the summer, the gasoline is, is less volatile because it's going to be hotter outside. Um, and so it's blended differently. If I ran winter gas, oops, if I ran winter gas in the middle of summer, what would happen is I would have an engine that, well, it started up great, but it might end up with some detonation problems. It might have some drivability issues. So there are some times where you have something running weird and it's just because Either it's old gas or maybe you got gas that's the wrong blend for what you're trying to do. So don't overlook the basics when you have an engine that doesn't run right and put in some fresh, you know, drain out all the old gas and put some fresh gas in there, okay? Two different blends. The winter gas is made more volatile, meaning that it evaporates easier, which promotes an easier startup. Of course, the colder the climate you live in, the more volatile the gas would be. For instance, if you know you're getting winter gas in Minnesota, that would be really vaulted, evaporate very, very easily, be very, very light. Versus um, here in Sacramento, it it wouldn't be nearly as volatile. Okay, um, so different gla gas blends. Gas is a seasonal thing. All right. Um, one of the one of the downsides of burning gasoline in an engine is we do get. Uh, some dead spots in the combustion chamber where uh, the air fuel doesn't mix really good and that tends to lead to more um, carbon deposits in the engine. This is an image of a flathead cylinder head and those engines were more prone to more dead spots, which means that basically they make a lot more emissions than the overhead valve engine. Keeping on the emissions theme, this slide is a picture of a catalytic converter much like the catalytic converter you would find on your car, but this one happens to be on a small engine. And there's cases where they actually put catalytic converters on small engines. The equipment manufacturers don't like to do that because these guys are expensive. If I um, change this over to green here. Um, yeah, these guys, these guys are expensive. That's why thieves steal them off the bottom of your car because inside that element, you have platinum, palladium, sometimes rhodium in there, and so it's precious metals. So not only does it add to the cost of the engine, but this thing works by getting really hot and burning up those exhaust emissions, so it tends to add to the heat of the engine and make the engine run hotter. So it costs, it makes more, it costs money to put on the engine, it doesn't help the performance, and it makes the engine run hotter, so whenever they can make engines that meet standards without using a cat, they will. But in some cases, they do actually put catalytic converters on small engines to ensure that they meet the standards. Okay, so moving right along. Um, we talked about the volatility, so that's, that's pretty good. This is a good slide that shows you like if you were using the wrong gas and the wrong uh, time of the year, what could happen. Um, and this is something that they talk about in the, some of the Briggs videos, the vapor bubbles. When you think about the emissions from an engine or a vehicle, you can't just think about what goes out the tailpipe. You have to think about total emissions, right? So if you put that car or you put the lawnmower, if you will, in a giant Ziploc bag, 
and caught all the emissions that were coming off of it, that's actually how the emissions are tested at the factory. They test it in a, in a standard for vehicles, they call it grams per mile, but it's, it's total emissions coming off the entire vehicle. So what that means is any emissions coming off of the fuel tank, raw, raw fuel or hydrocarbons, right, HCs, evaporating out of the fuel tank, that adds to your negative report, right? That adds to your total emissions. So you really don't want that. One of the things that we've seen come about in the last 20 years on small engines is to have a system to store these um, hydrocarbon emissions. We've seen sealed up gas tanks and all kinds of things to try to trap these hydrocarbon emissions and keep fuel from just evaporating out of your gas tank. Um, so to, to give you an example of that, um, I'll, I'm gonna change my screen share again. And this time, I'm going to just put up the desktop, I think. Um, let's see. Okay, there we go. Minimize that, we'll minimize that. We will minimize this. And there we go. Okay, let's make sure because somehow in the process of this, I lost my Zoom controls. I don't see those. Uh, give me a second. Hmm. Zoom cloud meeting. It's very weird. Oh, wait, no. Well, can what you guys see my computer screen? What screen are you on that you lost your controls? Well, I'm just on my desktop and I'm going to Zoom and I can see you, Elizabeth, but I can't see, and I can see my chat. I cannot see my Zoom controls and it's driving me crazy. You wanna share the screen? Is that what you wanna do? Yeah, I wanna share the screen, but the little box at the bottom that allows you to do that is your mouse uh, isn't my, making it highlight no it's not that's um i did something weird okay well um, hmm. Okay. Hmm. you can just see my face right now right and not the screen at all right this is so weird i have my okay wait a minute there we go got it <laughs> um, there we go. Okay. Um, share screen. There we go. Okay. So now you can see an image of a box of a gas, in, a small gas engine, six and a half horsepower, correct? Yes. Right. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, guys. The, the controls hid to my face and I had to click on my face and then I could bring up the controls. So <laughs> anyways. Um, so this was an engine, um, this is a Greyhound engine. They used to sell these at Harbor Freight. Now they sell the Predator brand, but it's basically a copy of a Honda engine um, produced by various uh, Chinese manufacturers. Mm. Um, I took this engine and took it apart for carting, but I took some pictures of it uh, on disassembly. So you can see that it says EPA, Environmental Protection Agency approved. Um, and then this one is for sale in California model. So it's a, it's a California certified engine. So it, it, it's gonna have to meet a little bit stricter emission standards than something that was made for sale in Wyoming or something. Um, so here's the engine on my workbench, a couple of shots of it. And here is a shot of the exhaust system. And believe it or not, this exhaust system, well, actually this engine when I, look, when I started to take it apart, I, what I realized is that this engine, emissions control wise, 
is like a 19, you know, 78 Chevy. It's, it's a 1970s car. It's got all the emission controls that you would have on a 1970s uh, passenger car. Um, so if I scroll, scroll through the photos, this thing that looks like a muffler, it actually has a catalytic converter inside this muffler. And then this little silver looking box on the bottom, there is a better shot of it. That's actually a pulse air injection system. So what it would do is it would take fresh air from outside that would go through these little, little vents and it would suck it into the exhaust and then into the cat to help the catalytic converter burn up the emissions. So it was, it was pulling fresh air in, mixing it with the exhaust and kind of keeps the burn going to burn up all those hydrocarbons and use up all the carbon monoxide and try to get everything turned into carbon dioxide or CO2. So I had a catalytic converter, I had an air injection system. If I go back a couple of slides, what you'll see is hanging on the bottom of the engine was this weird looking plastic canister. And that canister, if I followed the lines around, what I could see is that one line went up to the fuel tank, another line went up to behind the carburetor. Here you're looking at the float bowl of the carburetor, there's where you turn the gas on and off. Here's the control for the choke. If I go back a couple slides, you'll notice that this is an overhead valve engine, um, horizontally opposed. So what it had the, this. Oh, I'm sorry. What ahead. makes the difference between like the 1970s that you're talking about, like this engine has, even though it's mm -hmm. made for today? Like, what would other engines have that would be like? What's the improvement since then? You know, like you were talking uh, about that in, intake that burns, yeah. mixes with the exhaust. What do we do on other engines today? Um, well, today, you know, um, on cars, right, as we switched over throughout the 80s and 90s, as cars became electronically fuel injected. So right. they still have, um, they still have a EVAP system, but what you'll find is that they were able to kind of put less um, emission control components on cars because they got better control of the fuel. So for many years, cars got rid of having an air injection system, for example, because they didn't need it because they had so much better control of the fuel because they were electronically fuel injected. Oh. Um, nowadays, we're seeing sometimes air injection coming back, but it's, it's electric and it only runs for a few minutes when the engine's cold and certain things. So, um, why I say it's like a, a 1970s car is because in the 70s, cars had to meet emission standards, but they didn't have advanced computer controls yet. They didn't have fuel injection. So they added on all these parts, the EVAP canister, the air injection uh, pump, okay. catalytic converter. Um, so, so that's what you're seeing on these, on these engines. Oh. So now you guys should be able to see this, this slide with the gas can up and the, the, va the vapor bubbles. Remember that our small engines, you know, the gas tank is usually mounted to the engine. The whole engine vibrates around like crazy as it's running, right? That, of course, stirs up the fuel, which is then going to make more fuel vapors to be released by the engine, right? So having a, something to catch all those vapor, vaporous fuel, uh, um, all that fuel vapor coming off the tank is pretty important. Um, I'm going to put my screen share back on the internet. There we go. And I'm going to just type in EVAP system. Because you had asked me, well, what, you know, what would you have on a car? Um, I will go to this image here. This image would be similar to what you would have on a car, where you have this EVAP plastic tank, it's connected to your gas tank, then it's got lines that go to your engine. If I go to um, this picture, you can see again, you have your gas tank, but you have this vapor canister, which has charcoal in it, and then some lines that go to your engine. So what does that- that's an older one or a newer one? This would be a newer one because notice that they're using a, like a purge solenoid. So again, the, the EVAP system is controlled by a computer. 
Here's another one with a canister and it's controlled by a computer. Um, but the idea is this, any vapors that come off your gas tank, they go through these lines, they get stored in this little plastic tank that's full of charcoal and that's called the EVAP canister. Then when the engine is running, as it draws fresh air into, your, into the engine, it sucks those vapors into the engine from the canister and burns them. So it, it's almost like it's, it's burning that evaporated fuel so none of the fuel goes to waste. It all gets put into the engine at some point and, and, and consumed and it doesn't just evaporate out into the atmosphere, right? I mean, we, we know that if we took a gas can and let's say it was you know filled up halfway we took the lid off, we just set it in the sun and left it there for a week. A week later, all the, all the gas is gonna be gone, right? It's gonna be completely empty because all the gas would evaporate away. This system, this EVAP system, tries to collect those vapors, stores them in this plastic canister that's full of charcoal, the EVAP canister, sometimes called the charcoal canister. And then from there, when the engine's running, it sucks them into the engine. But so, our little guys, they don't have that, do they? The little two-stroke and four-stroke? Well, uh, your two-stroke engines usually do not. Um, however, if I... God damn it, again. Okay. Meeting controls, there we go. Okay. Um, all right, we got that picture up again of the... So um, oftentimes like your two stroke engines don't, just the gas tank is sealed and it's sealed with like check valves. So it lets air into the gas tank because as you're burning fuel, you need to let air in to get the fuel out, right? But it doesn't, it, it's designed so that the check valve does not allow uh, vapors to go out of the tank. So that's pretty common on like your small handheld two strokes and stuff because that, you know, they're trying not to make it where you're lugging around this, this canister. Um, however, more and more of your four cycle engines where weight isn't like the primary concern, especially if they're meeting California emissions, just like this engine right here, we'll have a little EVAP canister on there. And that canister is going to store the emissions coming from the gas tank. You can see that line. And then it, it, when the engine fires up and starts running, that line goes to either the air cleaner or the side of the carburetor. And then as the, the engine runs, it sucks the vapors off the, the little EVAP canister here and burns them in the engine. Oh, so clever. It okay. really depends. It depends on what emissions certification the engine is. It depends on how old the engine is, but you're likely to see this little EVAP canister. So mm -hmm. um, the fuel lines going to the carburetor would have liquid fuel in them, but the EVAP, lines are going to have vape, fuel vapors in them, right? So that relates to a test question when it's talking about, it, it, you'll see there's a couple of variations, but it'll say, well, like, what, where is liquid fuel at? Well, that's going to be in the gas tank and in the fuel delivery lines. Where is fuel vapor going to be? Well, that would be in the EVAP lines. Um, and so I just, these, these were some shots I had of an engine that, that had those emission controls on there. Um, <laughs> Again, if you're working on an older engine, it's not going to have all these things on it. Um, but if you're working on something newer, especially something that is um, emissions certified, this one's California certified, it's going to have it. Now, this image here, if I try to zoom, eh, zoom in on it, um, it tells you the air quality index, and I thought it told us what, oh yeah, what um, exhaust emissions. So like if you pop the hood of your car and it hasn't been in a wreck where somebody's replaced the hood, it'll tell you some of the same stuff. So this is exhaust, um, it, TWC, which is three-way cat, pair, which is pulse air injection. And I think that says CCS for a closed canister system. EVAP, so it, it lists all the emission controls, just like a car, so pretty interesting. I remember being very surprised when I unboxed this motor from Harbor Freight that I wanna say at the time I bought for maybe $100 on their sale or whatever, and it had all this emissions equipment on there. All right, 
So I, so I geeked out on that and took a bunch of photos and I'm glad I did so I could share them with you guys. Oh, thank you. So, um, thank you. so that, let's see, annotate. All right. Uh, all right. So that's, we, we, we've talked about emissions a little bit now. And we've talked about the EVAP systems and the fuel and how fuel changes by the season. Um, so now we're going to wrap up these primer bulbs, fuel pumps, and then other miscellaneous parts. So to do that, I will screen share back to the presentation. And we will... Go on here. All right. Could you just really quickly, what is vapor lock? I know it has to do with the bubbles, but that locks yeah. up the engine apparently. Okay. Yeah, I, I, and so you saw that on the on the video, right? The Briggs and Stratton video. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. So, what's tough about vapor lock is there's traditionally the vapor lock that I was familiar with before I really started to get trained on small engines. And so there's like the car vapor lock and the small engine uh, vapor lock. And I'm trying to think of the best way to do this. Um, I think what I'm going to do is open up the document camera so that I can draw, draw this out. Um, Cause I, I kind of feel obligated to tell you both um, styles, uh, what, what vapor lock was in cars and then what they're talking about in small engines and they're both similar. Um, so. Does it happen when they're cold? Does temperature have anything uh, to do no. with it? Okay. Yeah, no, temperature does have something to do with it. You're going to have it when things get hot. And basically, uh, what happens is, is it's like the car runs out of fuel. In that you end up with no fuel in the carburetor, and the, the car literally runs out of fuel. Not that there's not fuel in the gas tank. There can still be fuel in the gas tank, but we're not getting fuel to the engine. So in a car, if this is my high tech 1970s uh, car here, and it had its um, uh, gas tank in the back here, and then the engine was in the front, right? It would have to, it would have, it had a fuel pump. I think you have here. to share your, switch your share screen. Oh, oh. I gotta switch my scare screens. Blah, 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 blah. All right, give me a second. Uh, dang, I had some really good pictures going on too. All right. <laughs> How about that? Can you see a really <laughs> yeah. bad picture of a car? Yeah, it's okay. a great car. Um, so remember that vapor lock happens when the engine's hot. Um, and what the what basically happens is the engine runs out of fuel. It doesn't, you're not getting fuel in the engine to make it run. So like if you were driving this car, experienced vapor lock, it would be like on a hot day. Um, maybe you were climbing hills. Maybe you were um, towing a trailer or something behind you. So you're putting more load on the engine and the engine's making a ton of heat. That's a likely time that you would have vapor lock. In a car, you would have fuel lines that would connect from the fuel tank to the fuel pump, and then it would pump that fuel to the engine. Um, well, what would happen was, is there'd be so much heat coming off the engine and the exhaust system that the fuel would turn to vapor, it would vaporize inside the fuel line, and the fuel pump can't pump a vapor. It needs to suck liquid fuel. And so the car would literally run out of gas because it couldn't suck the gas from the tank up to the fuel pump. And so you would run out of gas, the car would act just like if you had ran the tank out of gas and you would 
kind of putter to the side of the road. And if you waited there long enough and everything cooled down enough where the fuel turned into a liquid again, and then you cranked it, cranked it, cranked it, cranked it, cranked it, eventually you would get liquid fuel from the tank back up to the carburetor and in the fuel pump and the car would fire up and run. And it, during this period of time, you would see people put like clothespin clips on their fuel lines. You might see people wrap their fuel lines with like aluminum foil, Reynolds wrap, um, to try to prevent vapor lock. Um, you don't see vapor lock anymore because what we do now is we don't have the fuel pump up here driven mechanically off the engine. What we do in modern cars, and when I say modern, like that's kind of going back to the 1980s, is um, we'll put a, a fuel pump that's usually electric. We'll either put it in the tank or we'll have it right back by the tank. So it doesn't have to suck the fuel very far and then it pumps it under pressure up to the engine. And so it, the fuel, because it's under pressure, doesn't get allowed to turn into a vapor, okay? So the car vapor lock was more about the fuel vaporizing in the fuel lines. The small engine vapor lock that you saw in the um, Briggs and Stratton video, well, what they're talking about is that you have, um, you have your carburetor and let's say this is the carburetor Venturi. And we know in the center of the Venturi, we have that nozzle where the fuel comes out. Now that um, nozzle there goes into the, the float bowl where there's, there's liquid fuel in here. And we gotta get that liquid fuel up through that nozzle and there's a main metering jet which is a restricted orifice there, right? Well, on some of the carburetor designs, you actually had an adjustment. You had a main metering adjustment with a screw that you could turn in or out. And if I turn the screw in, it would pinch off the fuel flow, lean out the mixture. And if I unscrewed the screw, it, it would let it richen up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, um, not only the, the problem with those screws are, is if I got in there and started messing with it, I could either make the engine run way too rich and that would make more emissions, or I could make it run way too lean and that could, that could burn up the engine, right? So the problem with screws are is, you know what, people are gonna see a screw and they're gonna screw it and um, that can create all kinds of problems. The other problem that um, Briggs said is that they said that, you know what, they get, they get bubbles in here. They get air bubbles getting caught between this needle and the, um, in the, in the jet seat, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then that can make the engine run out of fuel because I end up with a big air bubble here that the fuel can't get through. So essentially the engine runs out of fuel, it does a vapor lock, the fuel vapor happened to be right here in the carburetor. So in both cases, whether it was a car or a small engine, vapor lock happens when everything's super hot, and the fuel's turning into vapor bubbles, and the, 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 end, the end result is like the engine runs out of fuel. The difference is, is in a car, you were stuck on the side of the road because the fuel turned to vapor in the fuel lines. In the small engine, it's the fuel turned to vapor right around the, the main metering jet. Okay. So by getting rid of the adjustable system where you had that screw that would go in and out of the, out of the jet, by just having a fixed jet in here, um, well, one, it prevented people from having a screw that they could turn that could make the engine run too lean or too rich and screw up the emissions or burn up the engine. Two, if there was little bubbles in here, I now have a bigger passage and those bubbles could get through and it wouldn't vapor lock the engine. So that's, that's what they were talking about there. Um, you know, I feel like, just my opinion, I feel like it was probably 50-50 um, of keeping people from messing with stuff and uh, this vapor lock issue. Um, but that, that's, what they, that's what they mean there. So um, anyways, 
Um, while while I got my my crew crew drawing up, let me let me say one other thing related to this. Um, the video, uh, some of the videos, and maybe even some of the test questions. I was surprised this year when I took the test again. It seemed like the test got a little bit more difficult, and they actually asked you a question about an anti after fire solenoid. So I'm going to draw a solenoid here. And this solenoid is screwed into the bottom of the carburetor here, or bottom side in my drawing. And it's got a plunger. And this plunger can move, it can move in or out. And um, it's got a couple of wires going to it or at least one wire. And um, that wire, when you go to start the engine, you start, you start cranking it over, you turn it on, voltage, electricity is applied to that wire. And when you apply power to it, it sucks this plunger in so it's out of the jet. When you shut the engine off, the power here gets cut and the plunger then is spring loaded and it springs up into the jet and that essentially pinches off the fuel flow. So this anti after fire solenoid or anti dieseling solenoid, again, different names for the same part. But the idea is that when you shut off the engine, it shuts off right away and it doesn't try to keep running all weird and stuff. Um, so they'll put those on a lot of different carburetor designs to get the engine to shut off quickly, not make weird noises and it keeps it from making a lot of terrible emissions right as you're shutting off the engine. And it's a solenoid that plunges in and out of the jet. So why that's important is I've had small engines that they, they would start up and die, start up and die, or you couldn't get them started. And it was that um, I was never getting power. I was never getting my 12 volts electricity power to the solenoid. So the plunger was always stuck in the jet and essentially it was pinching off the fuel flow. So we'll see some pictures better than what I've drawn here um, in the in this slide presentation. And so I just wanted to give you some some background on how that works. All right, so I'm going to try to turn off my There's a question in the chat. Camera. Oh, how does old fuel affect, affect vapor lock? Um, old fuel makes vapor lock worse. Um, you, you can make it real uh, simple and just say that old, old fuel, that makes everything worse. Um, here's my controls. Okay, I'll get, uh, I'll get a fresh screen share going again. Um, give me just a second. So yeah, old fuel can often make the vapor locks uh, issue worse because it, um, a lot of the, the octane improvers will vaporize away and then you end up with more, more issues. Um, so, okay, I think I got the green box up, but just to make sure, can you guys see the presentation with the gas tank again? Chapter five, fuel systems? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that, um, you know, if you have an engine that's not running right, just as a, a, as a matter of eliminating the basics, you know, get rid of the old fuel and put some fresh fuel in there, right? If it's a two stroke, put some fresh fuel, make sure that the new fuel's mixed at the right ratio of fuel and oil. Um, and that eliminates that. And a lot of times that will eliminate a lot of problems. Your um, fuel, has a shelf life, what the gas company says, of 90 days. Um, some years ago, I got to take a, a tour at the refineries down in the Bay Area, and they, and they shared that with us. So like after they refine the fuel, they produce it, and they first pump it to the tank, I think the 90-day counter still starts going. So maybe it takes a week or so before it gets to the gas station, and you get it in your car or your small engine. 
what that means is, is that the, you know, after 90 days, the fuel starts to break down and you start to lose your, your less volatile compounds. And now that fuel will probably still run, especially in a small engine, because they're a lot of, a lot of them are not very high performance. So you can get away with kind of lousier gas, but that fuel might run for another year, maybe even a year and a half. But by the time you get fuel, that's, you know, so somewhere around a year and a half to two years old, at that point, it usually loses enough volatility where it won't even start in the engine. The other thing that happens is the, the lighter compounds tend to uh, vaporize and you're he left with heavy, heavy fuel varnish that clogs up all the carburetor passages. So um, your, um, oops, your fuel, uh, you, you know, you want to keep it, you want to keep it fresh as much as you can. All right. I am trying to switch this to the internet here and I'm going to put, uh, so stable, that's a brand. I, I know there's other brands, but this is a, a fuel stabilizer. I recommend you put fuel stabilizer in your engines before you park them and it will help keep the fuel fresh for a little longer. Remember fuel after 90 days, it's gonna start breaking down. Uh, and that's one of your most common problems with small engines. As the gas goes bad and it starts clogging stuff up. Okay. Um, so we get into several slides here about how carburetors work. And I'm not going to get into a, a lot of that because we did talk about that last week, whether it's the main metering system, the idle circuits, the float circuit. This does give a better picture of showing you the adjustable needle here where I, I could, this particular carburetor, the way it's drawn, this screw would adjust my main metering system, the air fuel mixture, rich lean. This screw over here would, would adjust my idle circuit, right? So that would be more like an old style carburetor that had all the adjustment screws. But what we need to talk about are these primer bulbs. Um, the primer bulbs help make the engine easier to start because it primes the system with fuel to help us get it going, right? A, a typical small engine um, doesn't have a fuel pump on it. It uses gravity to get the fuel to the carburetor. And that means that we don't have a lot of pressure there. In a case of like this particular design, the carburetor sits on top of the gas tank. So we would, it would take suction from the engine on his intake stroke to suck the fuel up in there. So the primer bulb helps keep us from having to pull the rope a hundred times. There's different styles of primer bulbs. This one in the picture here um, actually moves fuel up into it. So you can see it's tapped in the side of the carburetor. It's going to draw some fuel from the, from the tank, essentially, and, and push it through the different carburetor circuits and discharge a little bit out of the Venturi area to help the engine start in cold, in cold weather. Um, there's different styles of, of primer bulbs. Um, there's different styles of primer bulbs, and the, the two key different styles are wet versus dry. So if I, switch it back to the internet, Briggs and Stratton. And back to Briggs and Stratton primer bulbs, um, you can see that, boy, there's a lot of different primer bulbs here, right? Um, but you'll notice that some have a little hole in the end and other ones don't. And it used to be where like, you know, the red ones were vented and the, the, the black ones weren't, but that's not even the case anymore, especially if you get an aftermarket one, it, it could be red, it could be black. Sometimes they're clear. Um, so, Basically, you're looking here, does it have a vent on the top? That one doesn't. Or does it have a vent like this? If it's got a vent, it, it's, it's a dry primer bulb and that what you're basically doing is when your finger touches this thing, your finger closes off the vent, 
and it pushes a big puff of air through there. Here's one on an engine that um, you can see it's black in color, but again, it's, it's got the hole there, right? So my finger would cover the hole and I would push air into the engine. That little bit of air pressure would, would push air from the float bowl up through the carburetor circuit. So it's like, your, it's like a little air pump on this one. The closed primer bulbs with no vent, well, those will have vents, all right, like this one, um, it actually draws fuel, makes a vacuum, sucks fuel through the carburetor circuits. So the two styles are wet versus dry, and how do you tell the difference? Look for the vent on the top, okay? Most of your uh, small handheld stuff, chainsaws use wet primer bulbs. It's uh, only on the bigger engines that you see some of these dry primer bulbs. Um, if I go back to fuel system images, um, can you guys see that image on the, on the screen there? It's a black primer bulb. I don't see, it's not a very good picture because I can't see the tip very well, but it's not, I don't see anything poking out at the end. So I'm gonna say that's a wet primer bulb. Um, speaking of parts, what is this thing? You guys tell me. Or you could put it in the chat. I got that up as well. Is that, is that a fuel regulator? What is that? Um... Okay, so I wrote down it does two jobs. Um, one thing about Briggs and Stratton is they want to, just like any manufacturer, but I'm always impressed how well Briggs does it, is, is they want to cut costs at all, at all costs, right? Like they want to make their stuff work well, but they want to build it inexpensively as possible. Um, so what this guy is, is he is the, the bowl nut. He ho holds the float bowl on. Um, so there's, there's the float bowl on the bottom of this carburetor. This, you can see it looks like a nut here, right? And it's got threads on it. It threads on the bottom of the, the fuel bowl and it holds the bottom of the, the, the float bowl together. So it's the bowl nut. But if I look right in the center, there's a jet pressed in here and there's holes in the sides. So because this is at the bottom of the float bowl, it sucks the fuel in the sides and then it goes up through the jet. So this one component is actually your main metering jet and it's your uh, float bowl nut. So it's, it's two for one. And that maybe that saves them a half a penny per carburetor that they make. But when you're building, you know, I don't know, 10 million carburetors, like that, that saves a lot of money, right? So um, anyways, that's, that's one of the test questions that's a little tricky. And a lot of people go, oh, it's the bowl nut. And they won't realize that pressed in the inside of it is the main jet. Now, I've had several people take their carburetor out. They take it apart. They clean it. Well, they take this nut off. They set it aside on their workbench. They clean the carburetor. They put it all back together. It still runs bad because the restriction was right here. And they missed it because they didn't clean this out. So anyways, that's an important thing to know. Um, well, well, since we got these pictures up, we'll go ahead and finish this off. Um, this picture, I said, it allows for easy starting with the auto choke feature that's ready to start at all times. They call it the ready start system. So one thing you'll notice about this carburetor is that there's no primer bulb. And if you looked at the controls, um, there's no like choke valve that you have to manually close. Well, why is that potentially good? Or why, why would having a manual choke be a problem? As people will forget to put the choke on to start up their engine. In fact, I don't know if you guys have looked at some of the videos that are on the Still website, but there's like, I don't know, 50 videos that just go over how do you start your engine? And it's basically like, turn the, turn the switch on, turn the choke on. You know, it's, it's one more variable for people to get messed up. Also, if you left the choke on, it would make the engine run really rich. And of course that would make more emissions. So this system has this extra little spring in here. Um, uh, so we have a spring that works the, the throttle assembly, but we have this other spring that 
basically makes the choke come on automatically um, when you go to start the engine. So basically with this design, if everything's working properly, it, it, all you got to do is get up there and pull the rope, right? Pull, pull, the, pull the pull starter and it should automatically turn the choke on and fire up um, for you so you don't have to worry about choking the engine by hand. And they happen to call that ready start. So, all right. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll change our screen share again. And let's see, we'll go back to that presentation. So now I beat you up about primer bulbs. And um, I just wanted to kind of wrap this thing up. We talked about the anti after fire solenoids. Let's look at a couple different um, carburetor uh, designs that you would find on Briggs and Stratton products. So they have this, this updraft carburetor. And I'll make this thing. Big, I think. Oh I, oh, I know why it's going on. I get so much stuff on my screen, it's hard to see all the controls. All right. Um, so with my drawing tools, right, on this one, air would go, um, well, it goes down this way through the carb and then up like that. So it's an updraft carburetor. Here's a Here's a downdraft carburetor. You see a lot of side draft carburetors. This one's a two barrel carburetor. Um, lots of different carburetor designs. This one, you notice it's got this weird mixture screw that goes through at an angle, almost like my drawing that I did on, the, on my mini whiteboard. Um, if you are ever working on one of those, you have to take that screw out otherwise, because it goes all the way up into there. And if you try to unscrew this and rip the top off, you end up bending this, this mixture screw up. Um, anyways, one thing you'll notice is here is a side draft carburetor and it's got that anti after fire solenoid on, on the bottom of it. Here's a different design and it's got the side, it's got it on the side, right? So they'll have several different carburetor designs where they'll utilize this anti after fire solenoid. And again, the whole point of that thing is so that when you shut the engine off, boom, it turns off right away and it doesn't try to keep running. And it works by that little spring pushing a plunger right into the main jet and shutting the engine off. So um, let's clear those drawings out of there. And um, you we'll said those up. solenoids are 12 volts. Do they need batteries or something? I mean, how do they work? Um, so yes, yeah, so you usually see those solenoids used on like a riding lawnmower so it's got a battery on it okay i have a generator here and it's got one of those solenoids but again it's going to produce electricity as it's running it's got electric start so you tend not to see those solenoids on engines that don't have batteries but if an engine has a battery um it's likely to have one of those anti after fire solenoids so you don't see it on the really inexpensive stuff but on the newer more expensive engines you see those solenoids so again, here we have a shot where we can see it's got one of those solenoids. Um, here's, a sh here's a cutaway of that uh, one carburetor I was talking about, the updraft design, how the, the, the mixture needle has a tube that goes all the way to the top and people would mess this all up as they tried to rip it apart and they didn't understand how, how it went together. Um, all right, so just there's lots of different styles and we'll, we'll kind of finish on that theme this particular carburetor looks kind of weird because you're thinking, well, where's, where's the float bowl here, right? Shouldn't there be a float bowl? That's a terrible float bowl, but there should, shouldn't there be a float bowl on the bottom here that would have gas in it? Um, well, there should, and most carburetors would have that. But remember I said that Briggs likes to make things as cheap as they possibly can and still have them work well. So, this type of carburetor was called the vacuum jet. And here has the vacuum, here is how the vacuum jet went. Essentially, the gas tank itself acted as your float bowl 
and it had a pickup tube that went in the gas tank to suck the fuel out of the tank and into the carburetor. Super simple carburetor design. I have a, um, a mixture adjustment screw right here. Very, very basic carburetor. Uh, no real idle circuit on this carburetor. You'd find it in just like a push, push type lawnmower. Um, the problem with this design is when you had a, pu a full tank, it was like having a really high float level. Or if you had a low tank of fuel, it was like your float was now adjusted really low. So as your fuel load changed, it's almost like you were doing float adjustments. And so what you would find with this style is with the full gas tank, the engine ran rich. And with the almost empty gas tank, the engine ran more lean. Um, so when they started to require emission controls on um, small engines, when they had to meet emission standards, rigs, um, the first thing it is, they said, well, we better modify this design because it's all over the place with the air fuel mixture. And then after that, they ended up getting rid of it all entirely. But um, if some of you are working on an older lawnmower engine, you'd see something like that and you'd probably be scratching your heads like, what, what is this thing? It's a vacuum jet and it was just a super simple carburetor design. There's some diaphragms here that go, or there's a, a gasket on this one that goes between the gas tank and the carburetor. Basic stuff. Well, remember I said that the fuel load would cause this thing to change. And so they said, well, we better get rid of that design. And they went to this one, which looks very similar. This is the Pulsa jet. Still used the gas tank as like a float bowl area, but it basically had like a little diaphragm here. And the diaphragm would pump gas from this pickup tube. And then from there, it would pump it into this little area here inside a, a little like storage area built inside the gas tank, which then it would suck the fuel up to this pickup tube and go in the engine that way. So this had like a little fuel pump diaphragm in it. And so if you go to rebuild one of these, you'll want to get a diaphragm kit, clean it out really good. Um, and of course the whole cleanliness of the fuel tank is super important. This still didn't do the best job of keeping the air fuel mixture perfectly dialed in. So they got rid of this thing too, and now have more like your side draft carburetors, a little bit better setup. Again, here's, Here's a mixture screw, like a main metering mixture screw. If this had like an auto choke valve on it, um, but this is Pulsa Jet. The Pulsa Jet is an evolution of the Vacu Jet, and both of those things are Briggs and Stratton specific. Um, but you get the idea. Um, so I mentioned that that Pulsa Jet had a little fuel pump diaphragm, and that leads me to talk about what. Well, what about these fuel pumps? Um, most small engines will just use gravity to deliver the fuel to the carburetor, right? But sometimes that's, that's just not possible. So if they put a, a fuel pump on a small engine, oftentimes they'll use a diaphragm style fuel pump. So you can see I got this diaphragm right here and it's got these little check valves and it says it's got a spring and stuff on here. But basically, if we think about, um, our engine, and I'm trying to draw a piston here, but that piston is pumping up and down in the engine. That makes pressure pulsations in the engine. So if I tap a passageway to those pressure pulsations, and I have those pressure pulsations move this diaphragm, the diaphragm will act like a fuel pump. And as the piston moves up and down, the diaphragm moves back and forth, and I can use that diaphragm to pump fuel from a gas tank to the engine. So if a small engine is going to use some type of a fuel pump mechanism, it will usually use a diaphragm style fuel pump that relies on the pressure fluctuations in the engine to move a diaphragm and pump some fuel. These diaphragms do eventually go bad, and then you have an engine that you know, doesn't want to start up and run. You can spray gas down the carburetor. You can get it to run for a second, but it won't stay running because the diaphragms here are all um, whacked out. Small engines typically don't like to have a lot of alcohol in their fuel. Um, 
and they talk about E10 or 10% al alcohol in the fuel or ethanol or less because the alcohols in the fuels eat up those diaphragms really bad. The diaphragm carburetors you'd find on like a weed eater, a chainsaw, they have a fuel pump built into them as well that's one of these little diaphragm styles. So um, watch, uh, watch for that. Again, you know, when those get to be about five years old, by that point, the diaphragms are usually starting to get flexed out and they need to be replaced. Or either you replace the whole fuel pump or you can, you know, take it apart, clean it out and put new, new, uh, new diaphragm gaskets and stuff in there. Okay, so with that, I think we um, covered, you know, pretty much all the, all the carburetor stuff. Again, service like changing the fuel lines, the filters um, is important. Um, diaphragm, there's another, another shot of those diaphragm style carburetors. Let me get my drawing tools out of the way. Um, and all those things, you know, again, they get it to be about five years old. The alcohol content in the fuel has usually ruined all those rubber components. And about that time, they're going to need to be replaced. If you do that, you'll find that you have an engine that starts easier, that runs better, and by and large gives you less headaches. Um, so hopefully that um, made sense. And um, what I'm going to do is I will just hit some highlights of this other one because I'm going to a little bit over time, but I want to give you guys the, the information. So if you're able to hang out, please keep hanging out here. Um, and we'll hit a couple of the most important slides when it comes to um, governors. So first, let me ask you guys, can you see my governor's presentation? Chapter six, governors, there's some springs on the, okay, good. We're gonna go to this image right here. And I think the best analogy for a governor on a small engine is it's like cruise control. So just like you see in this, in this image here, um, it almost looks like they got a Prius here or something. Um, you know, if you set your cruise control to, to 55 and you're cruising down the road, everything's fine. As you hit a hill, the cruise control is going to want to keep you at 55, right? So as you start climbing the hill, it automatically opens up the throttle more for you to, so you can maintain that speed. If you start going down the hill, it starts to close off the throttle again to maintain that speed. Well, the governor in a small engine is designed to do the same thing. Is you, if, if it's a lawnmower, for instance, the governor's designed so if you hit some thick grass, it's gonna open up the throttle more for you. If you're um, cutting over short grass or maybe you got to the end of your lawn and now you're 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 go, going over your driveway or something so there's no grass for it to cut it's going to close the throttle to prevent the engine from over speeding so oftentimes with the governor everybody is so focused on that it keeps the engine from over speeding that they don't realize that not only can it close the throttle to keep it from moving too fast but the governor can also open the throttle to uh, compensate for more load being placed on the engine. Now, governor systems, there's three styles. There's styles like you see in this image here that use air, so they're called pneumatic, right? They, they use an air vane, usually off of the flywheel fins, it's blowing air off of a little vane, and that's how that tells the speed of the engine, right? The faster the engine's turning, the more air it's blowing around, the more it moves that vein. Um, so there's a couple of shots of a governor blade. That's the air style or pneumatic style. Um, but on top of that air style, there's also this one, the mechanical governor system. And I would say this is the most popular style today. Now, the air vein styles, like you have in this image and this image, um, those are really popular, especially on lawnmowers. They're cheap to make. I don't have to have a perfectly dialed in governor on a lawnmower. They get the job done and they're, and they're cheap and so it works. 
but as engines have gotten, you know, a little bit more evolved and we want to run them with tighter tolerances, most of today's small engines that have a governor on them will utilize a mechanical governor where there's flyweights and stuff inside the engine um, helping work against the governor spring to control the speed of the engine. So one type of governor is pneumatic or air, right? The other one is mechanical. There's a couple of shots of that. I'll get back to those in a minute because the last style of governor is a, a electric. Okay, so this one uses a solenoid. So I have three different styles, electric, pneumatic, and mechanical. And I would say by and large today, your mechanical governors are the most popular. All right, let's back up and talk about the mechanical ones since they are the most popular and what's going on with the spring. This is a great um, picture here, but it drives me nuts because some of the things labeled in this picture are labeled a little differently in the manual. And when you have to answer some of the governor questions, it gets a little confusing. Um, what's going on here? Well, this governor spring here in blue, okay, it's designed, and this it wouldn't matter if it's a pneumatic governor or a mechanical governor. The spring here is trying to hold the throttle wide open. So you can see that this throttle rotates this way up against a stop. So that would be moving, what, counterclockwise? This spring is pulling that. The governor spring is always trying to pull the engine to wide open throttle. That's really important to understand. It's so important, I'm gonna write it down. So I'm gonna write governor spring. Governor spring pulls to, to watt, wide open throttle. So the spring's always holding the throttle wide open. Well, what closes the throttle and prevents the engine from blowing up and over speeding? all this stuff down in here, okay? Inside the engine, there is going to be a cup, usually driven off of the camshaft, um, and there's gonna be some flyweights, and all this mechanical stuff inside the engine is spinning around. And as it spins around, it presses this um, flattened end of this governor cup against this governor shaft, that moves the governor lever and it basically forces the throttle closed against the spring tension. So you have mechanical weights inside the engine when they move out too fast or when they move out too far based on engine speed due to centrifugal forces, they fly out, they close things off and they, they fight against the governor spring. So the spring is always trying to open the throttle wide open. The weights on the inside of the engine, if I can get another shot, there we go. Um, those, are, those are trying to close the throttle blade. So um, the idea is that these weights in here they start spinning as they spin faster and faster, they fling to the outside. And then that makes the, that a little plunger move out and he then starts closing off the throttle. Well, there's some governor adjustments that get a little tricky. The very first adjustment that you would want to do, um, the one that's the most important, and anytime you like took apart the side of the engine or took apart any of this mechanical stuff, you would wanna make sure you did that would be the static adjustment. Um, and basically what the static adjustment is doing is you're getting the fly weights and stuff here pushed up against the little governor lever on the inside of the engine. You're getting like all the mechanical stuff set next to each other. 
it's not going to work if the pieces are all spread apart. They got to be set right next to each other. So that's the first adjustment you do. It's the static adjustment and it's getting all the parts pressed together. If you don't do this static adjustment, it's very likely that you'll fire up your motor. It'll rev to the moon and blow up because the little weights and stuff inside the engine, they only move, you know, maybe a half an inch or so. So if these parts, if there's too much play down in here, they'll move their half an inch and they'll run out of movement and they won't be able to control the engine speed. So three types of governors, pneumatic, mechanical, and electric. And then as far as adjustments, what's the most important one? The static adjustment, that would be the first adjustment you would do at any time you took like the cover off the motor or you took apart this linkage or anything like that, you'd wanna do that static adjustment. All right. Um, so um, you can see that on a lot of these engines, there's different spots where you can place the governor spring to create more or less tension. And your, your service manual would tell you for that particular engine and application where to put this thing. Um, it depends on what they want the top no load speed to be. Top no load speed is a fancy name for um, max RPM. Almost kind of like a rev limiter. So, um, you know, super important. Uh, so if the top no load speed is supposed to be 3000 RPM, um, you know, doing all the governor adjustments correctly will get you that desired RPM. And that might be, be depending upon what um, hole you put the spring in here. And, and so that's, that's all super important. What I tend to find people do, because they don't understand how this works, is they think, oh, my engine's not running very well. And people usually blame the governor for the engine not running well. Oftentimes the engines don't run well because they have old gas in them or the carburetor's clogged up and it makes the engine kind of hunt and surge, vroom, that on and off, vroom, vroom, vroom. you know, it doesn't have a smooth speed and they think, oh, that's the governor controls the engine speed. There's something wrong with the governor. But if the carburetor passages are plugged up, the governor is just kind of responding to those, those, pass those clogged passages. The engine starts running poorly, it starts to die, the governor opens up the throttle, now it starts running too fast, so the governor then closes the throttle, and you get this surge, and it's oftentimes related to a clogged up carburetor. But anyways, in that situation, people will tend to think, oh, there's something wrong with the governor, I need to, um, I need to uh, add some um, tension to the spring. And so they'll move the spring over here or they'll stretch it out or something like that. And then that just makes it run even worse um, because now the, the, the fly weights are fighting against more spring tension. So it is important where the spring goes. The spring tension is important. It's not just like a hardware store spring. It's, it's, it's a special amount of tension. And you really got to look at your manual to figure out how to properly set that thing up. Um, all right, we'll clear those drawings out of there. In some cases, you might bend a little tang to put more or less spring tension on there. Um, sometimes you select different holes in the governor uh, lever. Um, one thing you'll find is that a longer governor arm allows, allows it to maintain a, a more narrow RPM range. So you're likely to see that on something like an like a engine that's running a generator, because a, a generator has to spin at a very precise speed to generate the right uh, electrical frequency or cycles per second. So, um, so that brings us to, go ahead. Um, what situations have you adjusted that governor spring? And you may have already mentioned it, but like I know um, you, you tuners and all that, so. Yeah, so, so, you know, if I was 
taking a small engine I wanted to put on a goat cart or something, I take that governor thing off of there because I wanted my foot to be in charge of the throttle, not the governor, right? right. Um, so my early small engine experience was always like trying to remove or disable the governor, right? And I consequently blew up a lot of engines too. Um, when you're trying to get a governor system to work correctly, uh, it's really important to kind of go through the adjustments and follow the procedures in the in the manual. Oftentimes, what I will say is less tension works better than more tension. Um, you'll end up with more governor droop when you have more tension. So this slide's talking about governor droop. Mm -hmm. Now, what governor droop is would be, they say it's the maximum bulk horsepower rating. It's kind of like your, your max top no load speed. So let's say this engine at, in this case, 3,200 RPM, it makes six horsepower, right? And that's like the, probably the, the most amount of horsepower it's gonna make safely, okay? Um, okay? The top no load speed, maybe, maybe it, the top no load speed set for 3,600 RPM. So you got your lawnmower, it's at 3,600 RPM over here, you hit the grass, and it drops down to 3,200 RPM because it kind of bogs down a little bit. The governor opens up the throttle and you're taking all of that six horsepower to make that thing run. That change in speed from its top no load speed to its you know, maximum speed under load, which should be making the most horsepower, that's, that's what governor droop is, right? Well, if I, if I made the spring super tight, I stretched it out and I put that spring on the tightest setting, that might push my top no load speed all the way here to 4,000. And so then the engine's gonna be screaming at 4,000 RPM and I hit the grass and then it bogs back down to 3,200 RPM where it makes the most amount of horsepower. Right. So um, by making the governor spring really tight you end up with a, a bigger drop it or bigger change of speed between a loaded engine and an unloaded engine also when the engine is really revved up you're more likely to have parts break like connecting rods and cause all kinds of issues so oftentimes what i'll do is if i think i have a governor problem the first thing i do is i check all my other stuff i make sure that my carburetor is nice and clean it's got a good spark plug in there um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll eliminate all the ba the other bases so that I know that the engine should run correctly, you know, on its own. In fact, one of the things I'll, I'll do to, to even, because, you know, maybe I don't want to spend an hour trying to clean out the carburetor and all this, this and that and the other. Um, let's see. I will... I'm going to go back to the screen. All right. I'm trying to change this to my computer screen. And um, I'm going to put up a video here. Um, can you guys see a video of kind of a dirty looking engine on your screen? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Okay, so um, on this video, what you're looking at is that little link goes inside the engine and uh, goes to the flyweights and stuff. Here's my governor lever and link that goes to the throttle assembly. You can just see the edge of the spring right there, right? Yeah. Um, okay, we'll get this thing playing again. So one thing I would do is, um, work the throttle by by hand so this engine's not running obviously i got the covers off and stuff but i could have some of those covers on i could partially assemble this engine and i could still then get my fingers oftentimes or maybe even some needle nose pliers um and i could get them to the throttle link so here in a second i'm pretty sure well that's a Gross looking, uh, <laughs> there it is. okay, there it is. 
Let's see if I can get it on the screen. All right. So I'm working the throttle manually, right? By moving that, that link there with my finger. Right. So if I have the engine running, I thought, well, is the problem the engine, it runs like garbage or is the problem the governor? Just eliminate the governor. Hold the yeah. throttle yourself manually with your hand at a fixed level. Like maybe you have the engine, you know, over the sidewalk so there's no load on it. And I hold it at half throttle and I see what it does, right? And if it runs nice and smooth, when I'm in control of the throttle, that tells me that the engine's running okay and I do have a governor issue. If I tried to hold the throttle still and the engine's running crappy and bucking and snorting and, and has all kinds of surging, then that, that tells me that, hey, I, I got an engine drivability problem and it's not the governor's fault. It's probably clogged carburetor passages, honestly, but there's something else going on there. So work the throttle manually yourself to kind of figure out where to go. And then once I had done that, and if I had figured out that, yeah, the, the, the problem was a misadjusted governor, what I find is that most people will put too much tension on the spring. Now, if you look at this part of the clip, video clip, I'm, um, I'm moving the little slide valve. Oh, let's try it again. I start moving this little red slide valve here between the turtle and the rabbit. Right. Um, because when you move it to the rabbit, basically it puts a little bit more tension. And you see how much more tension? Was that a lot of tension? No, Not just a little bit more tension on the spring to get the engine to rev up. And so what I find is usually people, add, they, they, they start compensating for a drivability problem, they add way too much tension. So I'll usually start taking tension off the spring and then I'll look at what my no load speed is and I'll kind of go from there. Right. So I don't know if that exactly uh, answered your question, but uh, that, that's how I attack it. I think, um, I think to, so we talked about Governor Droop. I think to, um, let's, let's wrap this up and put it, put it all together. And we'll do we'll we'll try to talk about that static governor adjustment, um, and I gotta remember I gotta switch my screen share again. There it is. All right. Um, uh, we'll talk about this the 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 governor adjustments here. Um, the first adjustment you're gonna do is the static adjustment. What you're trying to do. And I won't. Okay. Okay, what you're trying to do is get this little piece here, they're calling the, um, they got the governor cup here. We're trying to get the governor cup, this little plunger, right up against this governor shaft that comes out of the engine. We want this piece pressed up against that piece. We don't want any play between those two. That's what the static adjustment is. So what you have to do is loosen this little nut, rotate that thing. In this case, I would rotate it clockwise with my little screwdriver tip there to where I felt it hit that little plunger and stop, and then I would tighten that nut back up. What makes this adjustment kind of complicated is that on this particular engine, the way they've drawn it, I would turn the screwdriver tip clockwise because that would move this governor um, shaft up against the governor cup and push those two pieces together by turning it clockwise. On other engine designs, I might actually have to turn it counterclockwise. So the way they write the procedure is universal and it kind of messes with your Your mind here. Yeah, the perception. Right. Is that engine so, off or engine idle? Engine off. So the, the static uh, adjustment is done with the engine off. So let me close these 50 things. Um, what I'm doing is I'm opening up a, um, a manual. Remember, you can get you can download this manual right off the Bridge and Stratton website. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is is I just did control F so I could search through the document and find my static adjustment. All right. So let me try to make that. A little bit bigger. Can you guys see on the screen? It says perform static adjustment. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I'll put my drawing tool back on. All right, so it says drain empty fuel tank. They're basically saying, hey, get the fuel tank out of the way, right? Just connect the spark plug wires. So that's your big clue. Hey, the engine is off when we're doing this adjustment. Um, and you're getting stuff out of the way so that you can get to that, that linkage and stuff that we saw in the other, um, in the other uh, pictures. So it says, move throttle lever A to the fast position. Remove nut B from the governor le lever. Um, so I need to get my Okay, so um, talking about well, it's still on a great. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, like that's not a good picture. Here, here's a better picture. Um, so this is the part coming out of the engine, and and basically, um, what they what you do first is you. Um, you do your static adjustment, then you do your, your idle speed adjustment, then you adjust your, your top no load speed. Um, but what is that static adjustment? What? Well, it says, um, while holding the governor lever C towards the carburetor wide open throttle, rotate the governor shaft until it stops. Torque the governor lever nut down. Basically, um, what they want you to do is open and close the throttle and figure out, hey, what, 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 what direction does all this linkage move when I open and close the throttle? And so you, you move it back and forth. And in the way this one's drawn, if I get my drawing tool back up here, what I would see is that um, closed throttle would be that way and open throttle, this little um, arm moves this, this way. So that would move that guy back. And you notice, oh, that's the same way the spring. The spring is pulling it that way, right? So if the spring's pulling it that way, that means that this thing is turning clockwise. So um, anyways, they have you figure out which way does this thing move by working the throttle. And in this case, and for this particular engine, it looks like it turns clockwise. And then you would turn it, you would loosen this nut right here, turn that thing all the way clockwise, and then tighten the nut back down. And what that's doing, it's getting the two pieces next to each other inside the engine. On other engines, you might work the throttle and realize that when you go from closed throttle to wide open, this little piece over here is moving counterclockwise, and you gotta, you gotta go the other direction. So, um, what's interesting is that this, I just downloaded this this morning, this is the newest version of the Briggs and Stratton manual. And uh, the old version didn't have this image where it actually showed you an arrow saying go clockwise. It would basically tell you, hey, you figure out which way it goes and turn it the right way. So it looks like they're trying to spell this out and make it a little easier of which way you turn it. But on some engines, you might need to turn that governor um, crank that goes through the outside of the engine into the inside and m moves the flyweights and stuff in there. On some engines, you might need to turn that thing clockwise. On other engines, you might need to turn it counterclockwise. But you got to get the pieces on the inside of the engine set up next to each other. Then you tighten down this little nut and your static adjustment is done. Once you've, once you've done that, 
assume he controls. Uh, one, once you've done that static adjustment, you put the engine back together and then you adjust your idle speed and then you adjust your top no load speed. And that would buy the, the top no load speed adjustment is done by adding or subtracting tension to the governor, governor spring. This one has a spring with like a little um, Phillips head screw adjustment. On this one, I would have to put the spring in different holes on there. On some engines, I might have to stretch the spring a little bit manually with by bending a tang. So it really, it varies all over the place um depending on the setup but the idea is that you're balancing spring tension with um the mechanical parts inside the engine the more spring tension you have the higher the top no load speed but you also tend to get more surging from the engine between no load speed and loaded speed all right um Remember that the first adjustment you do, static, and you do that with the engine off, and you'll be in good good shape. So um, it's one of those things where before you try to do a gover governor adjustment, it doesn't make a lot of sense. After you do it a couple times, it starts to make more and more sense. Um, you're only going to have a governor on an engine that has a fixed throttle. So like you see in this, in this um, picture here, um, I got the rabbit and the turtle. I, the, the throttle doesn't move around a lot. Like I, I set it to a level, right? I set it to halfway between the rabbit and the turtle or all the way to the rabbit, right? Whatever. Um, a fixed throttle assembly like that, you're, you, that's what you're going to find on an engine with a governor. When you have a, a throttle where you can work the throttle, like on a string trimmer or a chainsaw where you can squeeze your finger and it revs up, that's not going to have a governor on there. So, so chainsaws and stuff tend not to have governors on them, but your four cycle engines that would run a, a lawnmower or a log splitter, that's going to have a governor. Okay. And if it's not adjusted right, your top no load speed is going to be incorrect. And usually when you feel like the governor's freaking out, if you will, if you have all kinds of engine surging and stuff, nine times out of 10, that's due to the engine running poorly and the governor is kind of confused it, it's trying to respond or compensate but it's always a little bit behind the curve so you end up with this real bad surge of the engine if you fix the engine's drivability problem you'll probably take care of your perceived governor problem so hopefully um hopefully that may made sense it's um it's a tricky it's a tricky thing really uh, especially when you don't have one um you don't have an engine uh, sitting, I don't want to pull, sitting in front of us. So if I um, wrap this up, I mean, with that, like we've, we've talked about the, the major things. There's pneumatic governors, electric, and mechanical. The most popular today is mechanical. It's really important to... Um, do the static adjustment. Anytime you take this linkage apart or you were to take the engine apart, you'd have to do that static adjustment. That's your most critical adjustment and everything else there is, is fine tuning. Um, you will come across a question maybe about a governed idle spring. The governed idle spring is there. It's kind of like a secondary assist spring and it's there. So like, let's say you don't have the little throttle control all the way on the rabbit. You have it like maybe just above the turtle, right? So the engine's kind of on lower speed. And uh, you accidentally like push it over some heavy grass to keep the engine from stalling out. This governed idle spring gives it enough tension so that hopefully it will have enough RPM to not stall out the engine. So it helps the engine run a little bit more smoothly and be able to compensate for a little bit of load at lower speeds. And so, like for, for this one, um, if I was going to adjust the governed idle, I would actually take some needle nose pliers or a tang bender and I would, I would move back and forth. I'd bend that little tang to have more or less tension on my governed idle spring. Um, 
but the, anyways, um, so that's that's governors. Remember that that the springs are calibrated. They're they're it's not just any hardware store spring. If you'd really want to look up like the part numbers so you get the right tension of, of whatever governor springs in the engine. Um, it's not cool if you just like cut it, make it shorter, stretch it out, wind it back on there. That's going to goof everything all up. Um, hold the throttle by your hand. If you can control the throttle and the engine runs good, then you know you have a, carb uh, a governor problem. If you hold the throttle and the engine wants to die out still or run poorly, then you don't have a governor problem. You first have an engine drivability problem. Fix that first and then go over your governor adjustments. All right, with that, do you guys have any, any questions about any of the um, material that we've gone over uh, today? Because we went over a lot of stuff. I'm sorry we uh, went a little bit long on time, but we did, we did cover a lot. Um, I can put the whiteboard up. We can, we can go over more, more stuff if, if we need to. Um, I think at this point, you guys have the info that you need to know if you're having problems passing the, um, the Briggs and Stratton fuel system test, I think you should be dialed in and you should be able to get through this test at, at that point. Don't forget to go through those PowerPoint slides just by looking at the images and reading the text, you'll, that will answer a lot of those questions. And my hope is that you also have enough information now to pass the governor's test. What you'll, what you'll notice is that there's no governor certification in the STILL website because STILL doesn't use governors because they're using handheld two cycle engines where you're in control of the throttle. Um, but Briggs and Stratton has a governor's test because their type of engines do use a governor, okay? Um, both tests are pretty tricky. You, you can ace the tests. Um, just be careful, don't just start changing test questions at random. What I find is that students will, they'll start to second guess themselves and then they'll change an answer that they got right. They'll, they'll, they'll change their answer for questions they were getting correctly. And that they, you know, the first time they took the test, they got a 70% and they take it again and now they got a 65 because they're changing the wrong stuff. As you change, as you take the test questions, mark down the questions you're not sure about and spit, you know, try to look up the answer. And so that every question that you answer, you're sure, no, that, I'm sure that's the right answer. And so, you know, eliminate as many variables as possible. And if you do that, you should be able to get a good score on those Briggs and Stratton exams. Um, with that, if you don't have any questions, I'll let you guys get back to your, to your, to your regular lives. Um, remember, we have set up a, um, we have set up, a, um, a discussion board um, on the Canvas page, which hopefully I have that up and you guys can see it. Um, small engine tech help. If, if you have questions on your engine, post them there, post pictures there. Um, uh, you know, let's get some carburetors apart. I did a carburetor video. Uh, I also did a leak down test video. And I'll post some more things on there. Um, we're getting down towards the last few weeks of, of class here. Um, so try to get, you know, as much stuff done uh, as you can. Get your certifications and things done. And then, you know, just attack the things that you feel more comfortable with first. If you feel more comfortable taking apart just the carburetor at first, just focus on that. Um, maybe you want to mess around with the pull starter and, and you know, so, so, so knock off the things that you feel comfortable with. And, and then my hope is that as you do more things, you'll be comfortable with a little bit more, a little bit more, and you'll be taking stuff apart here, here in no time. So um, if you don't, guys don't have any questions, I'll, I'll let you go. Um, one last opportunity, any, anybody? Thanks, French. Okay, everybody stay safe, take care, um, work on some stuff, and hopefully have a little fun in the process, okay? Okay, right, thank you. All right. Thank you. All Thank right. You. Bye for now, everybody. Take care. Bye.